Well, Sean, they dragged us back. As Connor McDavid said, want to drag him back to Edmonton. He wasn't talking about us, you and I, or the media in general, or anybody that works for the NHL. He was talking about the Florida Panthers. But here we are in the lovely Delta Hotel, just about a block or two away from Rogers Place in downtown Edmonton. By the way, it is a very nice hotel. And we are talking to you on Thursday. Game six is on Friday. Place is going to be crazy. And the Oilers are one game away now from the potential of making history. How you feeling? Well, they're two games away from the potential of making one history. One win away from the potential. One win away. You know what I meant. They're two wins away <laughs> from making history. They would become only the second team to come back from 3-0 in a final. The first since the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1942. It, but it's going to take two wins in a row. That's the position they put themselves in by falling behind 3 nothing, And that's why it's so difficult to do this. Um, but it's an amazing story. I, I mean, just they're the first team to ever do it on the road to extend the series. Um, I think Connor McDavid has shown who he is over the last two games. I think other players have come up and shown who they are. I think Stuart Skinner has been better than advertised, especially when the chips have been down. And Chris Knobloch. People forget Chris Knobloch's a rookie coach. He's going against a guy who's done it for 30 years, and he's held his own. I thought that was going to be the biggest advantage for Florida was Paul Maurice's composure on this final stage, especially coaching against a guy who started the year in the AHL and never coached an NHL playoff game. And he didn't lose the room, and he didn't lose his own faith, and he's got him back to where they should be considered favorites in game six at home with that crowd. And let me just, before I give it back to you, let me just say something about that crowd. And I said this in game three. They never gave up. And it was ugly. In the third period, it's four to one. They're going to be down three nothing. And I've been in a lot of buildings, and there wouldn't be a peep. And that Edmonton crowd just kept coming. Let's go Oilers, cheering, screaming, yelling. It was amazing. And then they were given the opportunity to scream, yell, and cheer in an 8-1 game. And that place was electric. You're 100% right. I talked, uh, by the way, about what it is like here in Edmonton with an Edmontonian himself, our colleague Derek Van Deest. Uh, I spoke with him. You spoke with our colleague, Tom Galitti, who's been covering the Panthers now for a couple of rounds. Uh, so those interviews are coming your way on this podcast. Uh, Derek Van Dees talking Oilers and the series. Tom Galitti, our Washington-based colleague, talking Panthers. He can pretty much take up residency in Florida right now with as much time as Tom has spent uh, down there in South Florida and where they're at. Y you say they didn't give up. You're talking about the crowd. 100%. The Oilers obviously didn't either, right? That's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we are where we're at. But look at game five because the Panthers at home, down four to one, going into the third period, they come back. They make it a game, right? I remember turning to you at one point and I said, the Panthers are dead. And then 10 seconds later, Matthew Kachuk scores, right? Sort of a little bit of a throwback to what I did in the Rangers series game six in Carolina to you. And I said, the Rangers are dead. And then Chris Kreider scored a natural hat trick and the Rangers advanced and won the series. But if you look back at game three, the Oilers found something in the third period. It was their depth guys coming through, but they found something in the third period. And we don't, I don't necessarily think momentum does carry, but it, maybe it did. And then they went 8-1. And then it's 4-1 going into the third period of game three five well now the Panthers found something Matthew Kachuk found something he played his best game they make it four three Kachuk with the still might be the play of the series the diving play uh to keep the empty net you know keep the goal out of the empty net goes right to Connor McDavid he puts it back in but I wonder do you think that can carry over or is that not something that we can look at here because it's two days and we're coming into this raucous building now well, first of all, that's not the play. Of the it's series. not, but it was an awesome play. It was awesome. It was very reminiscent of the play in the Carolina series. Um, oh yeah, Martinuk. Yeah, right? Martinuk, and both teams lost, 
but both of them swept it off the goal line. But the Connor McDavid play on the Corey Perry goal oh. was was the play of the series so far. It was it was breathtaking. Um, do I think carry over? You know what each team found? It wasn't X's and O's. It was desperation. Right in Game Three, the Edmonton Oilers were like, "Whoa, boy! Like this isn't a joke anymore. There's no margin for error." We have to come, and we have to come hard because we need to save some pride. Whether they win or lose, they needed to save some pride. And that started in game three, and it continued in game four. And then you get to game five, and it's four to one. And now Florida starts doing the math. we got to go back to Edmonton. We're going to play in front of that circus. And I mean that in the nicest way because it is a circus. It is crazed. It's bazonkers. And then if we blow that opportunity, we got to come back for a game seven and anything could happen. So the desperation happened between the second and third periods. And you saw that from Matthew to Chuck, who has not been good in this series. He'll be the first one to tell you he has not had a huge impact. I know Paul Maurice has said he's done some other things for them, but what he does is he scores and he drags his team into the fight. And he did that in the third period of game five. So I think you're going to get two really desperate teams. And we talk about desperation all the time, but you can't manufacture it. In game one or two, you know, everybody always says, oh, it's not a series until somebody loses their home game. You know, so you can't manufacture that early, even though it's a huge stage. Everybody's desperate, but not like they've been desperate for the last couple of games. Now it's at a new level and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. You just take those 18 guys and you put them on the ice, and you say, go. Yeah, look, Paul Maurice talked about that before game four, right? He goes, you're going to have a difference here of two different teams, two different emotions. One's got desire, the desire to win the Stanley Cup. That was on the Panthers' side. The other's desperation, and that was on the Oilers' side. And we obviously see that desperation beats desire. And I think it was the same thing for the first two periods, like you said, in game, game five. Now I agree with you. That's why I think this game six – is going to be the best game of the series because you're going to have two teams that are desperate now as opposed to – because it's the first time we do. It's the first time we do in this series. But if you really think about it, Sean, we didn't get here. I talked to Derek about this a little bit too, and you hear that interview soon. We didn't get to 3-2 the way we thought we'd get to 3-2, but I think everybody kind of thought we'd be at 3-2 before this series started. And – the fact that it's 3-2 to two Florida kind of makes sense too, right? I mean, they were the home home team, home ice advantage. So we're in a position now where I think we all thought we would be. But here's the one factor. Connor McDavid is at a level even Connor McDavid has never gotten to. And I don't mean the stage he's on. I mean the level he's playing at on the stage he's on. There is an appreciation now for him that is at a different level than we've ever seen because he's doing it. He's not just living up to the expectations. He's exceeding them at this point. Nobody thought. I mean, he's, talk, he's, in, he's in the categories of Gretzky and Lemieux now with 42 points in the playoffs. So is that the difference? It's the difference why we're here. But is that going to be the difference because why history is made? In this series, like his Con- Connor McDavid is doing things that we haven't seen in years, and maybe that's enough for the Oilers. Do you think? So he's not overrated. Yeah, <laughs> somebody wrote that, didn't they? Yeah. Somebody from from down in South Florida, Miami, right? Yeah. Wrote that he's overrated. Yeah. It's just listen. I mean, people have their opinions, and they they try to have dissenting opinions to get people talking about it, right? That like, nobody could think this guy is overrated. Look, I've had a different opinion on Connor McDavid than everybody else. You never thought he was overrated. No. But you I, thought he played a different style of hockey. That yeah, was and, and, and I thought that he wasn't the MVP, and I thought that Leon Dreisaitl might be the better player on that team and, and all those things, but I never denied his greatness. And he is at a different level. I mean, we're talking numbers that have never been accomplished or rarely accomplished. They haven't been accomplished since Gretzky. What's, yeah. That's 35 years ago. Like, that's a long time. So he's the reason that they're here. And it's not just the eight points. It's the engagement level. It's 
I, I can't imagine the jolt of adrenaline and confidence you must get when you see McDavid start to wind it up and you know he's going and you know nobody can stop him. Like the win that went into their sails when he scored that goal, well, Corey Perry scored it, but he did everything but score it um, at the end of that power play must have been like a pure shot of adrenaline. Yeah. Like it had to be crazy. Like he can't be stopped. This guy cannot be stopped. Good luck, Florida. You're toast. Um, so, look, I picked the Panthers in six. I expected us to be here. Um, I think Florida's the better team. I thought Florida was the better team going in. I, I think there's so much immediacy, right? We were talking about the Florida Panthers like they were a dynasty after three games. We were talking about Sasha Bokhoff being the best defensive player, better than Bergeron after three games. We were talking about Bob Brofsky being the best goalie in the world and laughing that people used to laugh about his contract and what an albatross it was. And we were talking about Paul Maurice being the better coach. Six periods later, the whole narrative's changed because the results changed. Like, nothing's really changed. The teams are who we thought they were. And we're at game six, and it's been a really entertaining way to get here. At times, it's been frustrating, I think, because when you get to 3-0, you, you think it's going to be over, um, and it's not. And now, let's play seven. Well, it's probably going to be up to Connor McDavid if that can happen. Uh, listen, as I said at the top, talked with Derek Van Deest, our Edmonton-based colleague, and Tom Galitti, our Washington-based colleague, who's been covering the Panthers a ton. Let's get to that interview with Derek first. He talked all about the Oilers and how they got here and what it's like in this city right now, what he's hearing, and a little bit on the Panthers as well. Here's my interview with Derek Van Deest. All right, Derek, here we are. We're back in Edmonton. As Connor McDavid said, they dragged us back here. You had to come back. I had to come back anyway. You had to come back anyway. Sorry. I mean, yeah, it looks like this series has been flipped. But it's still the same situation for the Oilers. So has it been flipped? Uh, I don't know if it's been flipped so much as in, I don't think the Oilers should have been down 3 nothing after the first three games. And so I think maybe this is kind of evening out. Uh, you know, I think, well, I thought this is where we should have been going into game six. Probably 3-2 one way or the other. Uh, just the way we got here was a little different than I, than I thought we were going to get here. I think the Oilers think that as well. Um, there's a couple of things that have stood out for me. Obviously, the, the number one thing is the power play scored a couple of goals. So the power play's got three goals in the last two games. And early on, they couldn't. They were generating a lot of chances. They were throwing the puck around well. They just weren't scoring. They weren't converting. And they felt that if they keep doing that, eventually the dam was going to break and they were going to break through. And they did that in the last game. And also, I think the contributions from the bottom six of the Edmonton Oilers have been a lot more profound than they were obviously early on in the series. No one was, was scoring, but they're getting goals from guys like Dylan Holloway, Ryan McLeod, Connor Brown, Matthias Janmark, and they're chipping in and contributing. And I think that maybe has, has led to where we are right, right now in, in, in the shift in the series. But I always thought we would be at 3-2. Uh, you know, I wasn't sure what team would be up, but I think just the manner and the way we got here, 3 uh, nothing and then 3-2 is still different. Yeah, I think that's the thing. The narrative of how we got to 3-2 to is different than what anybody would have expected. But 3-2 makes sense. Yes. You know, and, and if you look at it, 3-2 in favor of the Florida Panthers makes sense simply because they had home ice advantage, right? Yeah. I mean, so that's how you look at it. But here we are at 3-2. One team, if you believe in momentum, and I don't know how much it carries game to game or certainly when there's two days, the momentum is certainly on the Oilers' side. I'm glad you brought up the secondary guys, the yeah. secondary scoring, because really this started with them. Yes. Right? I mean, and that's the key thing that I think – we look at McDavid, and he has been unbelievable, right? No question. We're no, nobody's doubting that. Like, I I wrote today that I think you can hand him the con Smythe in a press conference right now and then play game six, yeah. and it's done, right? But it's the other guys who, who got this going. And I wonder, does that make a difference for a guy like McDavid, for a guy like Dreisaitl, that it didn't all just have to be them? Yeah, I think it does. It makes a big difference because the, the McDavid and Dreisaitl, they do the heavy lifting, but they need... They need the other guys to chip in. They need the other guys. And they've, we've, I've always said that if you're going to win a playoff game, you need one of your non-top six guys to score a goal or, or do something. And I think 
Uh, the two shorthanded goals were kind of backbreakers, I think, for the pa Florida Panthers. Uh, their power play is not going, and then they've given up two shorthanded goals. But it, it's really it's interesting how it's kind of worked out. Connor Brown, who had an awful, awful regular season, he went 50 games without scoring. He got a standing ovation when he scored his first goal here. <laughs> you imagine yeah. that, getting a standing ovation. Just couldn't get anything else. Now, this is the Connor Brown that... Okay, this is the reason they gave him that money. This is the player that they were expecting to get. And so now he's kind of almost in his prime now. He's playing as this best hockey of his year, of his career. Matthias Janmark has always been a good playoff player. He's always, we've seen that before. So these guys are starting to come in their own. And, and you look at the, the contribution Dylan Holloway and Philip Broberg are making the playoffs. These guys weren't even around in the regular season. So these guys are just fresh and they're making those contributions now. But I think it, when, when you get those guys contributing, one, you don't have to have Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl on the ice every second shift, which is was the case in Vancouver, where I think yeah. they may have overplayed them, and that that was one of the reasons they kind of fell behind, in my opinion. Now you can roll the lines a little bit more. You can trust those other secondary guys a little bit more, and if those guys are, feel like they they belong, it's not just they're not just taking up space or taking up time until McDavid's turn to come back on on the ice. If they're contributing, that goes a long way and resonates throughout the entire yeah. team, in my opinion. The guy who really, well, there's two guys for the Oilers who really haven't put their mark yet on this series, and that's Leon Dreisaitl and Ryan Nugent Hopkins. And, you know, we're watching game five, and we're looking at Ryan Nugent Hopkins going like, you puck's bouncing on him a little bit. It's just not his night. But if you think about it, they haven't done it yet. So maybe they have it in them for game six. Leon Dreisaitl and Ryan Nugent Hopkins haven't made their mark. Do you think that is a positive at this point now? Whereas maybe a couple of days ago, this was a negative, but now it's like, hey, can we flip the script on that too? Yeah, no, exactly. Like we, everyone, when Connor McDavid went through his first three games and he only had three assists, we knew that breakout game was yeah. coming. We knew that four assist game was coming or that four point game was coming. He put them back to back. Dry saddle is kind of similar. Like, okay, he hasn't gotten the offensive numbers, and obviously Chris Knobloch touched on that today. He, but he's doing a lot of good things, but that game is there. That breakout game is there. That two goals, two assists, one goal, three assists game is there. And obviously, it, it, for the Oilers to be successful and continue, it has to show up in game six. But there's that potential there. Same with Ryan Nugent Hopkins. He's doing a lot of good things defensively. He's part of that huge penalty kill. Yeah. That, that's getting, you know, they're not giving it, uh, they just, what, they're 94% efficiency almost 95 percent now so he's part of that he's doing a good job on the defensive side of puck but yeah they need his offense as well they need him to kind of bury some of those chances and he had he's had some good chances he had a great look in game six and it was Bobrovsky made a great save at four three that would have made it five three and they kind of kept the game going for for Florida he hit the crossbar I, I believe it was in game two or game three hit the crossbar on on the, on the power play so he's getting his looks he's getting his chances he's just not converting and I think yeah, there's another guy that he's he's capable of breaking out. And, and you look at Ryan Nugent Hopkins and all that he's gone through with the Oilers. He was here for six really lean years, and he's been through the rebuilds. He's been through the multiple rebuilds, and he's seen the team struggles out. This is the biggest game of his life coming up, and, and you'd like to think that he's going to respond to that. Yeah. He, had, he did have a tough game five. The puck was bouncing on him. Sometimes that happens. The puck's not going to bounce your way. But if he can get it together, and you're right, if they have Leon Dreisaitl and Ryan Nugent Hopkins going, yeah, that's that's going to be bode well for the orders in Game Six. Now, the the bigger picture is around this city and, and, and being here. You know, I'm an outsider. Yeah, you're you're from here, right? So I'm an outsider coming into this city, and and I look at what's happening, and it's it's amazing. It's expected. Yeah, it's expected. I would have expected nothing less than what I'm seeing, but it's still nonetheless amazing. What is it like for a guy who lives here? year you know and is from here and has friends and family that are not immersed in the bubble of this series yeah. what are they talking to you about well the funny thing is that i've had people come up to me and say i haven't watched hockey in 10 years and i'm i'm living and dying with every you know with yeah. every game like it's like the people that they it has brought back people that have no interest in hockey suddenly are glued to the television and, and are living and dying with everything so it's what is interesting to me is like i was around for the 2006 run i was younger when the oilers were winning stanley cups in the 80s uh the 2006 run 
and now it's a different generation. I know I was uh, I I saw on Twitter that someone said my son was born in 2006 and he's 18 now and he's enjoying this run. Yeah. So this is a gen a run for a generation that has gone through that decade of darkness, has seen the team really struggle for so long, and now they get to celebrate it and now they get to enjoy it. And I think it's really kind of brought the city together because this is what they live for here at Edmonton. There's nothing else. <laughs> this is it. Right? I figured that out too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, when Zadorov said all there is is hockey, yeah. he wasn't that far off. Yeah. I know people took it as a slight, but people live and die for this hockey club, and to see them to be as successful as they are, uh, and they just enjoy the parties. They're just enjoying the ride. They're enjoying the party for as long as it can, and the fact that it came back for Game Six is a big thing, and they want to just keep enjoying it. And then they, and you know, they're two games away, two wins away from a Stanley Cup, the, and that's something that. You look at where this team was so long, not so long ago, you know, during those 10 years of missing the playoffs and just kind of floundering, um, you know, to be in this situation. It means a lot to a lot of people in this city. So let's flip it around, though, because the one thing I, you know, it can't be ignored that in the third period of game three, the Oilers started to find something. They lost the game, but they started to find something. And then obviously we know what happened in game four, eight, one and game five. And we're back here. Right. Well, in the third period of Game 5, the Florida Panthers started to find something again. Matthew Kachuk was brilliant. He was fantastic in that game. Clearly his best game in a very long time, not just the series, in a long time. Yeah. It was his best game. So we saw it happen for the Oilers. Do you think that now might be happening for the Panthers too? It's quite possible. Yeah, they, they made a very good push. They, they made a good, very good push in Game 5. And, yeah, it's little things like that. So when we saw in Game 3, I think the Oilers simplified things and said, let's just throw pucks at the net and see what happens. And they got a lucky bounce, and then they got a deflection, and suddenly we were right back in this thing. And, and I think they kind of carried that. And I think you're right. It, it would have been tough if the Panthers had kind of just rolled over after they were down 4-1 in that game and then got blown out. That would have been tough for back-to-back -back big yeah. losses like that. That would have been tough to recover from. So, yeah, to be able to come back in that game and make a game of it and for Matthew Kachuk to get on the scoreboard, they need him. They need him to play the way he can, he's capable of playing um, to get to, to win, to close this out. And everyone says the fourth game is the toughest to, to win because the other team is so desperate. And, and it's, you try to match that desperation level, but unless, unless you're in that situation yourselves, it's tough to do. But the Panthers are getting there. They don't want to go back to Florida now. They don't want to go home. To have this at Game Seven, because then, then that 1942 narrative will be brought up by everybody, not just all yeah. the fans. And like even in Florida, they're talking about 1942, mm -hmm. so they know about it now. So they don't want that narrative to come up. Uh, so they're gonna play. I think they're gonna play their best game of the series. And if Edmonton's gonna win this game, they're gonna have to play their best game of the series, and we'll see what who's got the better game and who comes out on top. Definitely will, Derek. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate you having me on. Good stuff there uh, from Derek. Obviously, his, he lives here, um, so he definitely has a pulse of this city. We're outsiders, Sean, coming in, mercenaries, if you will, coming in to cover a series. Uh, there's changes. As we talk now, we're, we're a day in advance here of Game 6. We're recording this on Thursday, Game 6, obviously, here in Edmonton, on Friday. Three changes of note for the Panthers. Only one lineup change, but three changes of note. The lineup change that we, we expect to see is Nick Cousins coming in for Kyle Ocposo. Does not surprise me. You get a jolt of adrenaline with a guy, a jolt of energy uh, with a guy like Cousins. Ocposo, I, I think he's, his speed has been an issue at times in this series. So that's one change. He's going to be on the fourth line. Ryan Lomberg, Kevin Stenlin, Nick Cousins. Lomberg came in last game, obviously, for Stephen Lawrence. The other two are interesting. Carter Verhage, who has struggled in this series, uh, he's going to bump up with Alexander Barkov and Sam Reinhart, top line. And Evan Rodriguez looks like he's going to play with Sam Bennett and Matthew Kachuk on the second line. But so that's, you know, maybe you try to get Verhage in, in a different role. Maybe, you know, it helps him out. He always plays well when he plays with Barkov. So you see that. But an even bigger one, Brandon Montour was not on the first power play unit for the Panthers. And their first power their power play has been dreadful. 1 for 16, two shorthanded goals against. Montour has been on the ice directly responsible for those shorthanded goals against. He was not on the point on the first power play unit. That's Oliver Ekman Larson now. So you think of those changes, Sean. Cousins in, Akposo out, Verhage up, 
Rodriguez, Ruth Barkov, Rodriguez now with Bennett and Kachuk. And the the biggest one, I think, Oliver Ekman Larson on the point as opposed to Brandon Montour. What do you think? Well, I think the biggest one is Rodriguez uh, on that line with Tachuk and Bennett. I, I thought in the third period they dominated. I, I mean, they just fed it to the Oilers. They couldn't convert. I mean, they did. They had two goals, I think. In yeah, the they third converted. Period. Yeah. Um, but they couldn't get that third goal that they needed. But, uh, you know, and it kind of ties into it because the one play to Chuck made was to Oliver Ekman Larson. Yeah. And it was like 2014 all over again. I mean, he just lasered it. You know, that that was the Oliver Ekman Larson that broke into the league that everybody thought was going to be a game-changing defenseman. That hasn't been the case for the last few years. But he knows how to run a power play, and they need to do something because – it's it's a liability at this point. Not only are you not scoring, you're giving up goals and you're giving the other team momentum. Like it's bad enough when you give them momentum when you can't score and you can't generate. It's worse when you let them score. Those are like bonus goals. You don't come back from that. That's what started the eight to one, and that's what started the run in game game four. Um, you need to be more solid and you need to change things up. So. I, but I still think the Rodriguez move is the move because that line really took it to the Oilers. Now it gets negated a little bit because Chris Knobloch has the last change and he can put out whatever forward line he wants and the two defensemen he wants. But I don't know if there's anybody that can match up with that line when it's going. When they're cycling and they're forechecking and they're punishing the Oilers, I don't know if there's anybody that matches with them. Brandon Montour, though, is a very important part of this Panthers team. He's a very important part of this team, and he is a guy who has been a big part of their power play. But if you look at it, the goal in game four, right, the one that gets the Oilers going, Matthias Janmark's shorthanded goal, it's Montour who's the guy back on a two-on-one, and he slides into Bobrovsky, takes Bobrovsky out of the play, and then Matthias Janmark scores. And then if you go to the game Five shorthanded goal. Again, early in the first period, both of these happened. It's his pass across the zone to Barkov. It's intercepted by Connor Brown, and Connor Brown goes and scores the, the goal that gets the Oilers started. So I understand taking Montour off the power play. I get it. You're not putting a guy in who doesn't know the power play. Ekman Larson has played on, for, he was filled in for Montour at the beginning of the season when Montour was out because, you know, recovering from the injury. And Ekman Larson's for years been a power play guy. But you hope the hope is that you don't lose Montour with this because a lot of Montour's game, I think, is predicated on being a part of it, on jumping in and being a part of the offense. You can't lose him in all of this. They've already lost him. Really? You think so? He's been he hasn't one been good. Of the, he's been one of the main culprits in the last two games. He needs to find his way back. I don't think they're losing him. I think he's lost. And he needs to come back. He needs to figure it out. Like, his skating has always been the thing. And now, for these last two games, he's been out of position. He's struggled, you know. And But you talk about that shorthanded goal in game four. Like, it's puck luck, right? Because Edmonton, their whole argument after three games was, it's an even series, we didn't get any puck luck. You think about that goal. And I don't know how many people noticed. Yenmark missed the net. That yeah. puck hit Barkov coming in trying to make a save, and he put it in the net. That shot was going wide. When you look at the overhead camera, Yanmark missed the net. Well, I got to take a look at that again, but I'll I'll trust you on that for sure. But it but it, but it's still it, it it was Montour. I know, back. but that's the puck luck that they were missing, and it all avalanched from yeah. there to to use another team that's been in the final <laughs> recently. Um, and Edmonton did get some puck luck, right? And you think about Florida had posts in game four. And Skinner made huge saves. He made two huge saves before the shorthanded goal where Florida could have been the team that was up one nothing. Um, So it's all evened out. And we're where we belong. I agree. Three to two, where we belong. Uh, you spoke with Tom Galitti, as I mentioned on the top and several times throughout this podcast, that you did talk to Tom, our colleague. He's based out of Washington, but he's been he's pretty much based out of Florida now, although he is with us here in Edmonton. He's been covering the Panthers so much. Here's your interview with Tom Galitti. 
Tom, it's nice to join you here in beautiful downtown Edmonton for the second time in this series. First time for you. Um, the Florida Panthers, they're in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, I mean, they're going to say, you know, anyone would be like to be up 3-2 in the Stanley Cup final. But obviously, you know, it's gone from 3-0 to 3-2 and the, and the Edmonton Oilers appear very close in their review mirror right now. And, and then it's going to be, you know, it's a stressful situation going into playing this game uh, six on the road here at, in Edmonton. You've covered Paul Maurice for a long time in this playoffs. He spoke yesterday about why are we all upset? Because he's not upset. How much of that do you think is Paul Maurice whistling past the graveyard? And how much of that do you think is real? Um, I think he's trying to put up, you know, for his team that, you know, all is well. You know, you know, obviously we didn't play great in game three. We played better in game four. I mean, sorry, great, great, great in game four. We played better in game five. And, you know, we have – there's positives here for us. I think he's definitely doing it for his team. Um, he pro- obviously, you know, he's trying to downplay the whole pressure angle that there's pre- – all the pressure is on them now because um, – why would you want to think about how much pressure is on you in this situation? You just said all as well, and all I could think about was the animal house, the the end scene with the parade. All is well, all is well. Um, I don't know if it's that bad for the Florida Panthers, but Connor McDavid has eight points in the past two games. Nobody's ever done that in the Stanley Cup final. Stuart Skinner's given them everything they've needed. He made two huge saves in the beginning of Game 5 that could have turned that game around. I think if the Panthers get the lead early in that game at home, it's a completely different game, and he made those saves. The only thing that I can see that I look at is the way that Matthew Chuck played in the third period of Game 5. And it reminded me a little bit of the way that the Oilers played in the third period of Game 3. And then they've taken that momentum and clawed their way back into the series. Um, do you think they can carry over the third period of game three? I, I'm sorry, of game five into game six here? I, th- I think that's their hope. I, I mean, they're, they're, they're stressing the whole game. They feel like they played well five on five. And there's numbers that back that are up that the five on five shot attempts are, are double. Um, some of that is score effect, but the, a lot of what the, what the Oilers did in game Five was power play or you know another shorthanded goal. Those things they, falling behind or early, I thought like was you know, I thought the the Panthers started well in Game Five, but then they get the power play, they get another shorthanded goal, and that took the wind out of them for the rest of that period. It probably took them a while t- to recover. So they want to keep keep. I think they want to keep it five on five at both both ways. It's kind of similar to what they were doing against the Rangers and uh, and now, but now. You know, because the Oilers' power play has come to life, and that's 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 a headache and on, on top of everything else with, with with Connor McDavid is doing. Yeah, I don't know if they can keep the series five on five <laughs> with the way that Edmonton's playing now. They're starting to ask questions that they didn't ask early in the series. They're going harder to the net. Connor McDavid is by far more engaged. I, I don't, you know, he had three points in the first three games, but he wasn't a huge impact and now every time he steps on the ice you hold your breath and that's who Connor McDavid is and there's no way to game plan for that I mean you look at the Corey Perry goal there were four Florida Panthers in a box he was boxed in and everybody tried to stick check him and he walked through all of them one of them twice and then gave the puck to Corey Perry and I loved Corey Perry celebrating like he did something he put his stick down well, it, it, that actually, for I guess, uh, yeah, that was a great play by by Connor McDavid. And I think I think he caught the Panthers in a way that power play was almost over. I think he thought. I think some of them thought, "Hey, we got through this. They're about to change." But what happened was Perry jumped on instead of Darnell Nurse and became part of the offensive play to score that to score that goal. Um, but yeah, Connor, it was Connor McDavid. Yes, Connor McDavid, f- five on five, he scored a goal, bad angle on on Bobrovsky. He's been. The, he's, I don't know how the Panthers put that genie back in the bottle. Like you said, he was not. He was. He was fine in the first three games, but now he's the Connor McDavid. You know, he's super duper Connor McDavid, and I don't know how you get him. Back, I don't know if they can uh, lasso him and get him back to being less of an, a factor. Yeah, they they definitely gave him life, and you know, they get the the Florida Panthers to get to three zero out goalied. Edmonton Oilers. Sergei Bobrovsky was great. He was being talked about as a potential uh, MVP candidate. He's been anything but in the last couple of games. Um, 
is there a way back for him? You've covered him for a long time, and th- this is the worst streak he's had in the playoffs. He's had bad games, but he's always bounced back. Yeah, I, I didn't think he was. I mean, the goal, the Mc, the McDavid five on five goal was not good. I don't, I don't know if I could blame him for the other three goals. There were some great plays made there. Um, a deflection. He was, you know, I I feel like this is a situation he can. I think if they get back to their defensive structure, they can go back to. I, I think back to the Rangers series. The game was the five four overtime game. That was not a great game for them. And then they next game was right back down to sh- shut it down to the way they played. That's he needs. They need to play better in front of him. And then if that happens, I think he can get back to the way he was. But they cannot play. He's not. I don't. I don't think we're going to see the game one the way he was again. I don't know if he's going to. That'd be a lot tall order for them to win a game that way again, I think. Yeah, I mean, he has a supreme confidence about him. Yeah. It, 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 it's amazing, but I think it's really being tested now in this series. I, I mean, it, it it's what? It's seven. It's 11 goals over the last seven periods, um, and they're not going to win that way. And I do. Their defense has to be better. I mean, we, we spent the first three games of the series lauding their defense and how good they've played. They have been anything but good in the last two games, in my opinion. Um, I don't think their defense was that bad last game. I think f- five on five, they. I think there was a, some power play stuff there that that definitely and this and that's and that and that obviously the shorthanded goal. I think that is their way back to winning a game. They need to go back and you know and obviously there was some score effect there, but they need to go back the way they played played against the Rangers, the way they played against Boston, and when we saw some of that in the third period, uh, second half of the game, game five against the Oilers, they need to get back on the forecheck. They need to pressure in that end, and that takes a lot of a lot of the. Thing, a lot of, that takes care of a lot of things. A lot of the other mistakes, there's, there's your mistakes in defensive end when you're not playing in your defensive end. And I think that's their, their what they need to do is to need to put the game more on on the Oilers defense again and pressure them in their end. We're 24 hours or so away from Game Six, which obviously is a pivotal game. Florida wins and we go home. Edmonton wins and now they've dragged Florida back to s- South Florida. Um, Paul Maurice said today, they practiced today, and he said that uh, he's going to change his fourth line. Ocposo's out. Nick Cousins is back in, joining uh, Ryan Lomborg, who came in for game five. But that's it. That's the only moves he's made. And it's the only moves he's made throughout the playoffs. Are we at a point where a more drastic move has to be made? Um, I don't think that makes their team better if they take somebody who has not been playing the entire playoffs. Those other guys have come come and gone throughout series. Usually after a loss, he's switched out the wings, or after one or two loss, you know, maybe it's, they've only this is only the second time they've lost two in a row in the playoffs. But yeah, I th- I think you're going to throw somebody in who hasn't played the entire playoffs. I, I think that's a lot asking right now. So he's going to move some things around. Uh, I you know Kachuk came to life like you said. Rodriguez went back on that line halfway through that game, and I think that provided a spark. They need to find a way to get Carter Verhage going. He scored the first goal in the series, and then he's done nothing. He has no points since then. I think he's minus nine since then. He's he missed a chance in Game Four that could have tied the tied the game. But uh, it's just not look. We're used to maybe we're holding him too high too high a standard. But he's we're used to him scoring all these huge goals for them, and he has not been a factor. They need him to come back. They need Barkoff to come back and be an offensive factor. They need Sam Reinhart. That that's gonna be looks like it's gonna be a line. They need something out of that line. I would say going uh, going in uh, in Game Six. Barkov, the best defensive forward in the league. I don't think any of us will argue about that. Minus four in his last two games. So they need more from him, and I think he knows that. Like I said, we're 24 hours away from the game, uh, game six here in Edmonton on Friday, I believe. I'm losing complete track of days. But uh, on Friday, what's your prediction before I let you go? Well, I know everyone thinks this is going back to Game Seven, so I'm going to go against it. I'm going to say Florida is going to find a way to get back to their game and win and win Game Six and and close out this series. Good stuff from Tom. We talked to Derek. You and I both talked Cup Final. You think uh, you picked Panthers and Six, so I'm going to guess, Sean. You think Panthers win Game Six? I'm going to stay with it. Yeah, I picked Panthers and Seven, so I'm going to go Oilers. Winning game six, and obviously Panthers winning game seven. We'll see. Neither one of us, our predictions matter at all because we have no idea what we're talking about in terms of the outcome of the game, but we can analyze what's happened. So that's all we've got here on the Stanley Cup Finals. We await now game six in Edmonton, but there's a lot of other news going on. It's been a long offseason already for a lot of teams, Sean. So let's break down some of the news that we've seen in the past couple of days. And we can start with Jacob Markstrom going to the New Jersey Devils. This was a long talked about stuff. We had, it, it was 
it was been you know brewing for a while. The Devils get Jake Allen at the deadline, so that fills the one B situation for their goaltending. But it still didn't help with the one A. Now they've got the one A. Does Jacob Markstrom, with what the Devils have already, make the Devils a playoff team? Unequivocally, yes. Agree. When you think about how close they came with the mess that they were in goal and the injuries that they suffered, sustained. Yeah. Um, oh, they were suffering by them. The, the upgrade in goaltending is massive. Just that confidence to be able to walk out and say our goaltender can win even if we're not at our best. I think one of the things that happened to the Devils this year was that they believed that they had to be better because of their goalies. And it put an immense amount of pressure on a very young team. And they cracked. And their goalies cracked. I mean, their goalies were bound to crack. They weren't good enough. Yeah. Right? They're just not good enough in net. And you're right. They they felt they had to be so much better because of that. Listen, at times the Edmonton Oilers have felt that. Yeah. And look where they are right now, and they're full faith in Stuart Skinner now because he's answered the bell. He's proven it, right? The Devils now have a guy who has proven it. He's played big in big games. He's had huge seasons, and he doesn't have to play 55 to 60 games. He can play 45 games, right? Because you got Jake Allen there as well. Their goaltending is so vastly improved that – like any other team, you say, well, as long as they're healthy. You say that with any team, right? You got to be healthy, right? Okay, let's put that out there. They got to be healthy. But the goaltending was – they they were bad last season because they didn't have goaltending. Yes, they need to be better in front of their goalies, but when you don't have no confidence in your goalies, it's very hard. They should have a ton of confidence in their goaltending now. If you think about it, in that division, it's still two teams and what else? Right, That's what we know right now here on June 20th. It's the Hurricanes. We expect them to be good again. The Rangers, we expect them to be good again, and we'll get to the Rangers in a second. But there's an opening. There's a big-time opening in that division, and the Devils are the team that we all expect to jump into that opening and maybe even be better than some of those two teams that I mentioned. And the goaltending makes a big difference. And if they stay healthy, yes, they. I would be shocked if they're not a playoff team next year. I think they're going to be better than the Rangers next year. They very well could be. And. Although the Rangers have goaltending. Well, so do the Devils now. Yes. And they gave up nothing. No offense to Kevin Ball. He's a, he's He can play top 6D, but. He's a serviceable he's a defenseman. Fine. He's not a game changer. Good guy in the room. He'll go to Edmonton and he'll be fine. With Calgary. Uh, Calgary. <laughs> and he'll be fine. Are you going to miss him? No, I don't think so. Other than his snarl a little bit, maybe. Um, and they gave up a first-round pick that they don't really need because they've hit on so many picks in the last couple of years when you think about Heesher, Hughes, Mercer, um, the other Hughes. Like, they just keep coming, and they have more coming. Damage. Like, they don't necessarily need that first-round pick. In a way, at times, you can't even use it with the salary cap. Once you get to a point where all those guys are coming up for contracts, you can't keep them all anyways. So it was an asset that was going to depreciate, and they used it for what they needed most. So you never want to give up a first-round pick, but I think if any team was in a position to give up a first-round pick, it's the New Jersey Devils. Yeah. And they get two years of Markstrom, right? So he's got two more years left on his deal. So they don't have to worry about a contract situation with him. That that's ironed out. I, I listen. I believe the Calgary Flames did what they could here too, right? I, they got a first round pick. That's beneficial to them. They got a guy in Kevin Ball who's a big, snarly defenseman that they can play. So it makes sense from their perspective they were going to trade the goalie. But I love the trade for the new, for the New Jersey Devils to get Markstrom. Okay, so that's one trade. Let's look at the other one. The Washington Capitals get Pierre Luc Dubois for Darcy Kemper. Straight up trade. You're basically taking a guy that the Kings regret signing to a massive contract. Let's not forget, this guy signed a on just less than a year ago, June 27th. So it's still less than a year ago. Eight years, $68 million. That's $8.5 million a year 
It runs through the 2030-31 season for Pierre-Luc Dubois, traded after one season. He had 40 points last year to the Capitals, who gave him Darcy Kemper. And Kemper obviously signed a big deal with Washington after winning the Stanley Cup with Colorado. And it hasn't quite worked out. Charlie Lindgren has outplayed him, and he's number one. But let's more to the point here on Dubois. This is his, he's 25 years old. This is now his fourth team. And he's asked out of two of them, Columbus and Winnipeg. I don't know that he asked out of L.A. Some would say he asked out of L.A. with his play. With his play, right? So he verbally asked out of two of them, and physically his play may have asked out of this one. Is he damaged goods? Or because he's 25 years old, are we looking at a guy and saying, you know what? There's still hope. I think they see him as a reclamation project. He, he He's is. a dangerous reclamation project because of the number that goes with it. You'd certainly like to have a reclamation project yeah. with a lower cap hit, but the Capitals don't have Kuznetsov anymore. They've needed to replace him. They don't have Backstrom. They don't have Backstrom. And Corberry has done really good with problem players like Tom Galitti brought this up in our 15-hour travel day yesterday. We had a long discussion about it. He turned Anthony Mantha into a tradable asset when he was unusable at one point in the season. Turned him into a 20-goal scorer, gave him the leash to do that, was able to trade him to Vegas. Didn't have much of an impact with the Golden Knights. Um, Maybe Carberry's one of those guys that could take damaged players and make them whole again. Maybe. I mean, this is a this is a huge gamble. Yeah. It's, a, it's just an enormous gamble. It, it, you're trading a goalie, Kemper, who you, you don't like his price tag. I think it's $5 million, right? So you don't like the price tag on him, but at least he could be serviceable, right? $5 million goaltender. That's good. Well, not if he's not your number one, right? It's not your number one. That's but problem. But Lin, Lin Gr- Lindgren's got what one more year cheap yeah well no I think he's an RFA but anyway it's not even that he might have one more year it's it's not even that it's you're trading a goalie who might find it again a goal a Stanley Cup winning goaltender on a really good team but he is a Stanley Cup winning goaltender to get a guy who's on his fourth team now it's a huge gamble if it works out for Washington it's a brilliant move if it doesn't work out for Washington it is a cap problem for a couple of years now so we'll see how it does we know his talent is there that's the one thing i don't think that's ever been in question and that this guy's talented it's just a pierre luc dubois got to be able to put it together and, and we'll see if he could do it in washington they're taking a gamble another one to talk about the rangers waived barclay goudreau which after his postseason i didn't know if they were going to do that but then you really take a cold hard look at this He's a three point six million dollar, three point six four two million dollar fourth line center, right? Who is not part of your number one PK, uh, really? If you have Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider and that, I mean, Goudreau's a big part of their PK, and he's a big part of their team, an alternate captain. But it's really hard to have a three point six four million dollar center, right? Fourth line center. So they wave him, uh, and there's probably some deal worked out there with Mike Greer and Chris Drury to make it happen, but. Goudreau goes back to San Jose, and he's got three more years left on his deal. The Rangers free themselves of the cap hit and the player, so they have to replace the player, and he's an important guy. He obviously was a really important guy for them, scored six goals in ten playoff games. I like the move for San Jose, though, to get Barclay Goudreau because, I A, their cap is not what the Rangers' situation is. They're rebuilding. They have to get to the floor, number one. They have a lot of young guys. They're going to get another one in Macklin Celebrini. And here's a guy in Barclay Goudreau who's won the Stanley Cup, knows the market, plays the game. He's a grinder. He's a winner. If he embraces the role, he could also be a mentor now too. And he will because he's a true professional. And all he's done since junior hockey is make the playoffs and win. And score big goals doing it. And, And score big goals doing it. They will miss him. I agree. Next April. Um, you we'll can see how they replace him, but yeah. You can replace him serviceably, and then things get tight. And there's certain players 
that rise to that occasion and come up big. And they're role players, and they're players that don't make an impact all year. Like, you could argue Barkley Goodrow was serviceable at best during the season. He was invaluable during the playoffs. Overtime goals, big goals, played a huge game. You noticed them every game, even when he didn't score. I think it's a big hit. I understand it's one that the Rangers had to take, but it's a big hit. They got three years out of Barkley Goodrow at that value, and and they made the playoffs each time, and they made two runs into the conference final, and he played big roles in both of those runs. So if you want to look at it in that sense, they got a they got great value out of Barkley Goodrow, and they don't have to pay the rest of his contract. So maybe they got the best years they could get out of Barkley Goodrow in that contract. So it makes sense. I understand the deal, but you're right. They're going to have to replace him. That's a t- that's the job that Chris Drury's in right now. He has some holes to fill, and he's going to now he's got another one that he created to fee- to cr- to to fill that hole. Time to do it. So it makes July first, and you know, or the draft is just shown. By the way, the draft is in a week. Okay, like oh, eight days, and we're here in Edmonton for the Stanley Cup final. Awards are in six oh, days. It's oh. <laughs> amazing. Eight, seven days, right? This seven next days. Thursday. We, neither one of us can figure out our, our math on our, our dates because we just don't know at this point. Bear with us on that. Last piece of news, though, before we get out of here. Columbus. So we know Don Waddell takes over. Pascal Vincent's out. They need a new coach. They're looking for a veteran coach. But even bigger than that, Patrick Laine, who, you know, has, has been that guy that we've talked about and, you know, What's going to happen with Line A and all that stuff? And acquired, by the way, for Pierre-Luc Dubois from the Winnipeg Jets. And now you've got the Columbus Blue Jackets looking to trade Patrick Line A, where Don Waddell says, we're all playing nice in the sandbox right now because he wants to make sure that everything goes okay. But they want to get rid of Patrick Line A. They want to find a deal. They want to try to get a trade partner for Patrick Line A, uh, another sort of reclamation project he's still by the way in the nhl player assistant program too nhl nhlpa player assistant program been in it since january 28th but columbus you got don waddell looking to make moves now too and this one makes a whole lot of sense it doesn't it doesn't no it makes sense it it, it's not working it hasn't worked from day one really with line in columbus but I would argue that part of the problem is he needed help. Well, yes. And he's gone and got that help. Like, don't you want to see who he is? But you may. But it might be best for Patrick Lining, too. Well, it might be, and he wants to be traded. Right. And that's the difference in it. I think when you're in that situation and a guy says, look, I need a change of scenery, for me, it becomes I need a change of scenery for you, too, because you're never going to get the best right. me. Um but it puts you, as in Don Waddell, the GM, in a really precarious position because you're trading an unknown asset at this point. We all know Patrick Line can be a great player. He's, what, number two pick in the draft? He thought he should have gone number one. Um, he's had some really good years. He can score. If he ever figures it out, he's still young. If he ever figures it out... The team that gets him, whatever they pay, and they're not going to pay top dollar now. They're going to pay pennies on the dollar. Is going to make a killing. It's interesting, right? Because line A, I guess much in the way of Dubois, is that reclamation project. Also, albeit in a different way, a reclamation project. Um, But you're right. The team that gets line A, it's similar Right, The Capitals are hoping that they can get the best out of Pierre-Luc Dubois, the best that we have not seen yet. We have seen some greatness out of Patrick Laine, but just that best has been a, it's been a long time since we've seen it. I have to think that, when a, when it, that there's a team out there, or not, if not multiple teams out there, that look at Patrick Laine and go, we got him. Because you know why? Like you said, you can get him on pennies on a dollar. You're not going to get pay a huge price for him. And what does he do? He scores goals. What's the hardest thing to do in this game? Score goals. If you can get a guy who's a known commodity scoring goals, I think teams should be lining up to get him. 
if Columbus is going to trade him, especially if it's not going to cost you that much. There's other factors at play, and I understand those factors. But teams should feel confident in the, in their ability to get the A, the best out of Patrick Laine, and B, put Patrick Laine in the best situation for Patrick Laine. If I'm Don Waddell, the first phone call I make is to his replacement, Eric Tulski. Yeah. And say, do I have a deal for you, my friend? <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. You saw what I did with Kuznetsov. You can do it again. Put him that's, in. A- that's Finn Central. So he's insulated with a bunch of really responsible Finns who play the game the right way and, and in a way, run that room to a degree with a lot of other character guys on that team in a not very demanding market. I got a, two other teams that I'm looking at for this one. and I, w- I wasn't looking at Carolina because same division, all that stuff. Yeah, it all, I don't goes, think it, it all goes out the window. You get assets. Of this course, point. of course. One, teams is playing game six, Florida Panthers. We don't know what Sam Reinhardt's situation is. Barkov, Lining. That's number one, right? They will have the cap space to do it depending on. they got a lot of different things. We'll see what happens. The other team, Dallas. That's also Finn Central. And they just lost Joe Pavelski. Dallas needs an infusion of goal scoring, right? A lot of Finns there as well. So I think both of those situations could be beneficial. Carolina, too. I'm not going to discount it. But Carolina, too. But those three, those three situations could be good for them. If either of the teams that you suggest signs them, as a bonus, he gets to go back to Tapita. That's right. That's a good point. Global Series next year, Florida, Florida and Dallas. That's a you are a hundred percent right. He was a rock star <laughs> there two years ago. While I covered when he went, um, you don't even understand. And he ended up getting overshadowed by Miko Rantanen, who had the hat trick in the game. But before, in the lead up to the games. He was a complete rock star. Yeah. Like, there's nothing like him. And I personally, selfishly, would love to see him get that magic back. When you think about the confidence that kid had coming to the NHL, so unfin like, so unfin like, I deserve to be the number one pick in the draft. I'm going to be the best player. Like, God bless him. Like, bring that Patrick Line back. And I hope he finds it. I hope that's what the player assistance program does for him. And he comes back with confidence and a swagger. And he and he finds his place. And I think there is a place for him somewhere in the NHL. And, and the, part of the reason I say the Carolina Hurricanes, because what do they need? They need a goal scorer. Yeah. No, it'll be interesting. Look, lots of stuff going on off the ice. But we still got game six going on on the ice here at Rogers Place in Edmonton, where we are right now. This was a lot of fun, Sean. So you're saying it's over. I'm saying Florida and six, and I'm telling you right now as a public service announcement, because you're getting older, to bring your earplugs. Bring my earplugs? No, no, I want to hear it all. No, you don't. I want to hear it all. You're going to have tinnitus when you get older. (laughs) Trust me, from a rock and roll guy, your ears are going to ring. You're not going to be able to sleep. You bring your ear, you bring your earplugs, buddy. No way. I'm hearing it all. Game six here, Friday night. I say... It goes seven. Sean says it goes six. Enjoy it.